Hey, well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming out today. I didn't think that it was going to be a packed house like this, but ChatGPT is the thing right now. You're probably hearing a lot of it going on and everybody's kind of curious to know how could I utilize it? How could I use it in my everyday life? How do I use it for business and personal matters? So I created the ChatGPT Mastermind because I wanted to bring people together. I want to build community around this technology that's going to be revolutionary game change how we do things going forward. So just a little bit of background information about me. Uh, my name is Elizabeth. I go by Liz Lopez. And I'm gonna go over the agenda for today to kind of give you a feel for exactly what we're gonna be doing today. So I'm gonna start off with an introduction about the Chat GPT Mastermind. I'll let it go into more details about what I do and who I am, uh, why ChatGPT, and what industries are using ChatGPT currently, and how you can use ChatGPT in everyday life. And then I have my first guest speaker who is an AI data scientist. I'm super excited to have him today because he is the whiz of AI technology. So I'm super glad that he decided to come and partner with me today and be one of my first guest presenters. So introduction, a little bit about why the ChatGPT Mastermind was created. I wanted to build community and bring people together that are like-minded individuals that are trying to find out efficient ways on how to be able to use this technology for everyday use. And this is a purpose so we could collaborate and learn together and work through this change and be able to embrace it while it's coming onto the market and streamlining everything, how we, how we do things today. So the purpose is obviously to help each other to learn and implement through collective knowledge, experiences, and resources. So I wanna be able to share ideas, expertise. People come from all different walks of life in this field. Uh, some people are probably very new to this. Some people are probably expert AI data scientists and coders and programmers that are utilizing this every day. So I want to be able to network and utilize this to build relationships with one another because you don't really know where this, going to, where this is going to take you. Maybe you're going to rub elbows with people in here today and be able to say like, hey, why don't we partner up and do this business plan or idea that we have and how do we push this forward utilizing AI technology today. today. So I want to create, be able to solve problems and brainstorm together as a community and continue to build out this ecosystem, offer each, offer, offer each other support and some type of accountability that we could host together, and then talk about future events that are coming up in Las Vegas in regards to different workshops and, workshops and conferences and things around this technology. So a little bit about me. I am a Senior Economic Development Specialist for the City of Las Vegas. I've worked in different capacities at the city in economic development, specific, specifically for asset management, for business development, and redevelopment. So my current role right now is to attract businesses to come to Las Vegas to diversify our economy. And that creates a workforce and it, it creates huge initiatives to be able to, to work together to build community to make life better. And so that's my current daytime job and I'm just starting to do this on the side because I feel there's a lot of value in building community and working together. And how do we could push this to the forefront going forward? Um, I am a champion and Las Vegas ambassador for economic development, for business development, for real estate, for finance, for innovation, startups, and being able to push that from a government, per government perspective forward. Because there's a lot of people that um, in government that maybe they maybe don't know the bigger picture and uses of things of how we could implement AI technology and tools into everyday practices. So I want to be the advocate and be able to continue to foster that ecosystem and be able to push things forward, not only on a personal level, but on a government standpoint as well, because sometimes government is a little late to adapt to things, right? So if I could continue to educate my leaders on why this is important, and be able to create this ecosystem. I mean, you, you see how many people are gathered here because we know that if we do not embrace this, we're gonna get left behind. So this is the whole purpose of that. And um, one of the things I'm very good at is bringing people to the forefront and bringing things together and bring community together and being able to uh, create relationships and build a network and leverage everything that we have or resources that we have in our pocket to be able to make things and point uh, to actually point out to a bigger vision of whatever it is that we're trying to create. And one of those organizations that was actually founded through this type of community effort is Tech Alley. 
And you are here today at Tech Alley. Um, if you haven't been, go to techalley.org. I know I see a lot of familiar faces here on um, people that actually come to Tech Alley on a daily or monthly basis. But it is used to bring people together. We started off with, this started off in sight as, an, as an idea with Josh Levitt. Josh Levitt came to the city and said, hey, we need to build community. We need to create um, innovation and in, incorporate technology into what we do every day. So he came to this idea with this, to the city about two and a half years ago. And I, my manager told me, he's like, Liz, take it and run with it. And that's exactly what we did. So it started off with 40 business meetups, 40 people that would come to about three to four different business meetups about two and a half years ago. And it has grown to over 15 different business meetups, including ChatGPT Mastermind, which is now created, and Las Vegas AI Technology, which is Matt, which I'll, Matthew, which I'll introduce to him in a little bit. So these are the type of tools that and resources that are available to us every day and how we could utilize this in our everyday lives and be able to leverage it and being able to educate ourselves, being able to implement things and maybe maybe even make a career change. So that's a little bit on the career side. On the personal side, I have worked in nonprofit for several years. I have worked in different capacities and being able to represent and provide scholarships for underrepresented youth. So in my capacities, I've worked on a committee for Project 150, raised hundreds of thousands of dollars to help dozens of students in high school that are trying to obtain a higher education and try to improve their quality of life through education. So that's a little bit of my nonprofit back work, uh, work that I've done for the, the community, in addition to working for, Project, uh, for Village of Becoming. Village of, Village of Becoming is another nonprofit that helps underrepresented youth as well. Um, the first year, we actually raised money, 20000 to help about 10 different students. So that's a little bit about my background. Um, I did, is there any Rebels in here? You want to help Rebels graduates? Go Rebels! All right, so um, I'm a Rebel at heart. I am a forward thinker. I like to push things. I like to move the needle. And I've always been like that ever since I was a child. Um, and I think that's unique, right, to, for a person like the, like the person with my mentality to work in government because I'm the, I'm the one that's going to be asking the questions is why are we not doing this how can we do this better how can we implement this into our everyday life and embrace this so that's a big huge of what I'm passionate about doing is bringing things to the forefront uh, so I did receive my bachelor's in business administration with an emphasis in finance at UNLV and then I went back for my executive MBA as well so why chat DPT so it, as you may have heard, it is an open AI tool, and right now it's free for people. It's a natural processing language, and it's like basically having a research assistant at your fingertips. It's so powerful in what it could do. The research and information that it brings to the, to any, you could ask it any question, and it will research all the information for you and spit it out to you, depending on how you actually program the language. So um, you can ask it questions and you can have a conversation with it. It's almost like talking to an expert matter subject person that is in the field. You could ask, you could ask it to talk like an IT expert professional. And it's like we have to embrace this now or get left behind. And this is why it's important that you're all here and I appreciate you all coming out today. Um, I just used a prompt earlier this week because I wanted, I had to build this presentation, which, by the way, was done with the use of ChatGPT and DALE. A lot of the images that you see, I actually created using DALE, which is another open AI platform to create images. And we're not going to go too much into that today, but I just wanted to let you know what I've utilized so far to create the presentation that I'm giving today. So I asked ChatGPT, what industries are mainly using ChatGPT? And as you can see, it spit out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different fields of how it's being used and where it's being used today. So you could see like the customer service, they're employing a chat box. And this is good for small businesses because if you don't, if you don't have the staff and you're trying to scale up, you have very limited resources. And being able to use open AI technology and chat, the chat bot, is a way to be able to communicate with your, your businesses 
on a 24 seven, on a 27, 24 seven schedule. And we can't like as a small business and entrepreneur, there's, you don't have that capacity to be able to hire staff to answer questions around the clock. Um, so this type of technology will help in providing better customer service for any field of line. It doesn't have to be your own personal business, but it could be also for work. E-commerce, e-commerce is embracing this and they're actually interfacing the, they're, they're having interfaces with the customers and being able to find products for them. Etsy's using it, people on Etsy are actually utilizing this at this moment too. And it's being used for content creation and marketing. People are utilizing this in a different aspect than most. Um, you have influencers using this to create content for their social media. A lot of people on social media and people that write blogs are creating this today and being able to utilize this to be able to create content for them. Um, it's being used in healthcare. Healthcare has been, it's been integrated to telemedicine platforms for triaging patients and it provides general health information as well. Um, finance, it's financial institutions are using it, education, people are using, utilizing it to research projects to be able to ask it questions and educate themselves as well. And entertainment, the AI has been, AI applied has been developing and in in being able to create stories using this technology. So I'm going to highly touch on this, but um, most importantly, how can you use ChatGPT today? So I'm going to just basically go down uh, some prompt engineering tools that could be utilized to create a list, to long, to long write prompts, you basically create essays and emails and templates for you, complex problems, feedback commands, like rewrite this essay for a fifth grader, modification prompts, reward this to sound like a finance professional or IT professional, and translate it to me for a different language. So we'll go into a little bit more of this live demo. I'm just gonna hi highly talk about some of this stuff. Um, you could use it to create an instructional guide. You could tell it to create a five-day meal plan using a paleo-based diet uh, with a 2,000 calorie count every day, three meals per day, and recipes and ingredients for, for this. So, I mean, if you're a fitness health expert, you could create plans for your clients utilizing this. So, um, and also it's used to write and debug code. So I just want to thank everybody today. Please connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm always trying to build community to make life better. It's important for me. It's a, not only a career of mine, but it's a personal mission. Um, also, please sign up for the ChatGPT Mastermind. You could go ahead and scan, bar, scan this barcode right here, and it will take you to my LinkedIn account. I'll give you guys a second if you guys want to go ahead and scan the barcode. If not, please feel free to connect with me too afterwards. And, you, and if you could sign up for the chat GPT mastermind, it's very easy, it's simple, it's free. Just go to meetup.com and sign up for the chat GPT mastermind for any updates and events and other guest speakers that I'll be hosting as well. So with that being said, I want to go ahead and introduce my first guest speaker. This guy is brilliant. I am so fortunate to be able to connect with somebody like this. Uh, his name is Matthew Renzi. He is an AI data scientist, an author, and a speaker. He's trained over 400,000 software developers and IT professionals to date. He is the president of Serenzi Global, which is a 501c nonprofit focus on tech ed and underrepresented individuals. So a lot of our values definitely align. I'm very fortunate to work with him. He is currently in school for obtaining his master's degree in AI at John Hopkins University. And he will go ahead and provide the chat GPT demo and Q and A. And I'm so happy to have him as a guest speaker. Let's give him a round of applause, please. <laughs> Um, while we're getting things ready with my presentation, uh, anyone that's in the back, there are more chairs in the other room. Feel free to grab them. We've got spaces around, some back here as well. And feel free to let the people in the hallway know if they do want to come in, we've got room for them. All right, I'm going to move one slide real quick so that things flow a bit better.
All right, so quick show of hands. Prior to today, who had heard of ChatGPT? Okay, that's almost everyone. Who has at least tried it once? That's almost everyone too. Who is using it every day, multiple times a day? That's a few people, okay. So I am one of those people. I'm using it as frequently as I use Google search engine and constantly for tasks all throughout my day-to-day -day workflow. In fact, it is quite easy to say that this has fundamentally changed how I do work and I don't see it's ever going back, only going forward. In fact, I would say this is so profound in terms of its uh, impacts on my productivity and just confidence in trying new things because it reduces the risk of trying something new that it's, I think it's safe to say that we have entered a fundamentally new era in computing. Like this is, I, I hate to be a hype engine, but this is one of those times where it's necessary. Like this is as big as mobile phones, the internet, and the PC for me. Like the way I'm using this is so powerful, it's hard to even describe. But I'm hoping I can show you some of that here today. All right, so what is ChatGPT? All right, so it's an AI powered language model. We already talked about that. Um, it essentially takes text as input and it produces text as output, but it does it in some pretty powerful ways. It was created by OpenAI, which is a research company that has been working on technologies like this for quite a while, and they're making some pretty profound improvements in other than just chat GPT areas. GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. Generative means that it creates new text from scratch. It's generating the text. Pre-trained means that it's self-supervised uh, on a bunch of text data before they start fine-tuning it. They send a bunch of data to it and ask it to do little tasks like, what's the missing word here? What word should come next? And fill in the blank kind of things, which trains up the whole lower network so that they can fine-tune it on the top with a couple of pretty clever tools. In addition, um, we, it's mentioned it's a language model, but this is what we call a large language model because of how big it is and how much data it's been trained on. Uh, something like 8 million documents, which is roughly 10 billion words, have all been fed into the system and used as the training set for it, which leads to a model that has 175 million parameters. And it's hard to describe what parameters are if you're not familiar with the you know, technical terms from uh, machine learning, but we can kind of roughly assume that a parameter is kind of like a neuron in a brain. That's a really crude analogy, but the more parameters we have, the more powerful the model can be. And these models keep getting bigger and bigger as we go. This wasn't the first of these iterations. We started with, chat, or with GPT-1, GPT-2, which is where I first started using it. GPT-3 came out, which was even more powerful. And then GPT-3.5, which chat GPT is based on. And just this week, GPT-4 came out. And I'm happy to announce it is as good as they're saying it is. It's able to do some tasks that I just can't do with GPT-3. So I've been experimenting with it all week long, essentially seeing where its pros and cons are. And if you'd like, we can see a demo of that as well too. So what can you do with this thing? I mean, literally, the list is almost endless. You search, Q&A, text generation, summarization, interactive like ideation sessions, style transfer, language translation. You can be an interactive teacher, which is how I'm using it quite frequently. Uh, doing troubleshooting, both like on code or with technical devices. Uh, for example, it helped me fix my LG washer because a weird error code showed up and I couldn't find the manual for it. And code generation, I'm using it all day long to help me write better code. Faster, much faster. All right, so let's see a quick demo. Um, I've got to switch my monitors here so that I can see what you're seeing. Which will just take a second. Is it possible to drop the show? Uh, yeah, that yeah. one we can. I think we can do this one without messing up the video feed, but I don't know for sure. Quick question. Is that, um, the four, and no, that's GPT Pro. But if you if you pay for GPT Pro, you get GPT four as part of it. Uh, but you don't get access to the GPT GPT four API, which is what programmers use to talk to this. Um, you have to be part of the uh, beta for that. Okay, that did uh, one second. Okay, so we can see the same screen now. All right. So when you log in, um, you essentially see this interface, which has all of my previous chats on the side. I checked just to make sure there wasn't anything weird that I was like searching for or asking before we started this. But oh yeah, I, I've taken screenshots of this for like the presentation. I was like, oh yeah, maybe I should pull that out. I don't know that everybody needs to know that. Can you um, turn off the light behind you? Yes, the light. Oh, this one. Oh. Oh, good call. Oh, oh and it's so okay. is this going to help too? Well, that's the camera. That's the camera that's got to stay on. Is it better with light on or off? Off. Off. Okay, we'll keep that one off. Should we try lowering this one too? At least for the demo. Okay. Uh, would Would you try lowering this one too? Yeah. Okay. 
All right, so the second thing you see here is that we have the ability to select models. This is part of the pro. If uh, you're paying for it, you get the opportunity to select GPT-4. I'm going to do all the demos with GPT-3.5 uh, Turbo, which is the default model, because it's a lot faster. But we, I will show you GPT-4, and we can ask some more complex questions so you can see that as well. It's just it's slower than we want to do for the demo right now. All right, so what kind of things can you do? Anything that you would search the internet for is where I typically start. So something simple like, what is the capital of France? And it's going to give you a simple and quick answer. But you can say something more complex like, uh, what region of France is it in? And so it's going to give you, um, it's using the previous context in order to answer the next question. So when I say it, it knows I'm referring to Paris. Like, you can't do that with Google. All right, so uh, what's something somebody's always wanted to know about Paris? Anything? How tall is the Eiffel Tower? How tall is the Eiffel Tower? Whoop. <laughs> All right, so now we can ask something even more complex, like uh, how tall is that in, we'll say, SpaceX rockets and see what happens. Okay. I mean, that's a pretty complicated thing to ask. Like, Yeah, I mean, that would have taken a little while to do with Google search. Okay, so in addition to essentially just using it to search for factual information, we can use it in a questions and answers kind of interactive session. So like, um, what should, sorry, should I talk about during my presentation on large language models at Tech Alley this week? I didn't ask it this. I already knew what I was going to talk about. So, and it's giving me essentially an outline of the, the key topics that it thinks you should mention in this presentation. Yeah, it's but effing also, cool is the, the right response. You could also do your marketing and branding, like yeah. type something out and you put in some sexy words. Yep. It'll come out and it'll sound All right. Cool. Let's try something oh like that. God. All right, so write a quick uh, abstract for this presentation. Whoops, that's not a question mark. Uh, sorry, I'm not used to typing on my laptop keyboard. I have like a contoured one at home. Okay, so we're gonna ask it to write a quick abstract for this talk. So, I mean, this seems pretty good. Presentation provides comprehensive overview of large language models, artificial intelligence, like GPT-3 and BERT. All right, so let's shorten it first. So this is on any Browser or yeah, all you have to do is uh, sign up at uh, sign up at OpenAI. All right, so we're shortening the, the topic here. All right, so now it's about half the previous length. Now, whoops, meow. Now make it sexier. I hope this doesn't do anything that offends me. <laughs> this cutting edge presentation delves into the world of large language models. AI powerhouses revolutionizing the way we interact with language. Explore the intricacies of models like GPT-3 and BERT. Get ready to be mesmerized by the potential. So I mean, like in terms of marketing, and I could even say improve this for SEO with these keywords and it would do that. So it's pretty powerful with these kind of things. But not only can we do this, we can ask it for like ideas like, uh, all right, so give me an outline for this talk as a short list of bullet points for each main topic. And so this is one of the ways that I use it. When I'm trying to organize my thoughts, I will, I'll send it to like a research paper. I'm like, just give me the key ideas from this. Give me a little abstract. And I typically do it with bullet points because they're just easier to read. And then I can say things like shorten each bullet point. And it's going to do that too. Matt, can you tell us what prompt you're typing? Because we can't see the Oh, you can't? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let's see if we can blow this up a bit bigger. Um, let me close this down here, go into full screen mode. 
Uh, yeah, I can try. It's just it's a lot of oh, just the prompts. Okay. Just tell us what you're prompting because we can't see. Okay, I, I'll do that. Let me get out of this then real quick. F11. Okay. All right. So you know that's essentially shortening each of these bullet points. So it's just like two to three words essentially, which is quite useful. And then I can say, you know, well, let's make this about the ethics of AI instead. So make this about the ethics of AI instead. Uh, I'll say AI for large language models, for LLMs, and it'll figure out that that's the acronym instead. All right, so make this about the ethics of AI for LLMs instead. So now it's changing the, the topics here to talk about the ethical considerations, current initiatives, and the future of this technology. So I can go through and I can iterate like this with a, a creative session where me and this machine are coming up with ideas together and I'm helping it refine its ideas and it's helping me refine my ideas just like a co-pilot. Question. Um, so is it something where you have to copy and paste the information or can you create a document for you? There's different ways to do it. So if it knows about that text online, it already has it in its, uh, in its language model. And so I can say, you know, give me a quick summary of this paper on, you know, uh, uh, attention is all you need, which is a page, uh, an article about transformers, very popular. And it'll essentially give me that outline. If it doesn't have that document, or sometimes it doesn't give you essentially a good summary of the document, because it's not perfect, um, I will take each section of a research paper and I will put it in one at a time and I'll tell it, uh, summarize this as a list of uh, short bullet points um, for each key idea. It'll give me a list for each section. Then, just as of this week, I take that and I move it into GPT-4, just the outlines, and I say shorten this, simplify it, and uh, make it as short, remove redundancies, and make it as short and as simple as possible without losing uh, key information. Because GPT-4 does a much better job of that than GPT-3.5. So that's kind of how you figure out where to use which for which, because GPT-4 is much slower. Yes? Uh, as far as knowing how to structure your questions yep. to be the most efficient, where, is that just in practice, or is that something that you so a couple answers to that. Um, we refer to this as prompt engineering. Um, it's kind of like speaking to the computer in English, like you're coding, but you're coding in English. And so you can ask it very basic questions with just natural language and it'll give you good answers. But when you're trying to do much more complex things, you have to get really good at figuring out how to uh, tell it what you want to get out of it and then iterate on it. Because the first time it may not give you the right answer. By the third time, if you keep pointing out where it's wrong or what you specifically need, it'll usually give it to you. But in terms of like prompt engineering, I'm using this for like research at Johns Hopkins. So I will actually build these very well-crafted prompts where I'm essentially providing it with stuff in the form of like columns of data and how that maps to real language, uh, what the target variables are, what their parameters and context is. You know, here's a, an example of what you should see coming in. Here's an example of exactly what I want it to look like coming out. And then I kind of fine tune the prompt. Here's you know, exactly where I would put that information it needs to decode. And then you know, some final instructions about you know, how I want it to do it. So a lot of just fine tuning over many iterations, just like anyone who's worked with like DALI or stable diffusion, you don't get the right image the first time. You go through and you continuously refine it until you get it to do exactly what you want it to do. Um, and that example I showed you there, that's something I, I pipe into the API or the programmer interface for it. Okay, so where were we at? Ideation. All right, so we can change the context of it. We can work back and forth with it to get you know, good creative ideation sessions going. But we can also do things like style transfer. So I'm going to say something like, um, write a poem about an audience attending a presentation at Tech Alley. I'm going to say beautiful audience. About a B E A U T full audience. Beautiful is one of those words I always have to spell out the letters or I will do it wrong inevitably. But with ChatGPT, now I can correct my spelling. Point. <laughs> All right, so in the heart of Tech Alley, a gathering takes place with brilliant audience, a sight to uh, embrace. Their minds ready, uh, their minds are eager, their spirits alive, ready to learn, to be inspired, and thrive. I mean, this is a poem, it's got good meter. I could even say, do it in like, iambic pentameter or whatever, and it'll do it. But you can also do style transfer. So for example, I can say, now uh, write it in the style of, we'll do Dr. Seuss. How do you spell Seuss? One person, please. All right, that's right. Okay. And Dr. Seuss has a very unique style of writing. In fact, there's actually a name for it. I can't think of it off the top of my head. In Tech Alley, where folks are so smart, a presentation is happening 
It's a, a work of art. The audience is curious, full of glee, with eyes that twinkle and smiles so free. I mean, that sounds like Dr. Seuss wrote that. <laughs> so you can also do even more complex things like write it as a haiku. Whoops, that's not okay. <laughs> audience at tech, eyes bright with excitement. Knowledge they'll gain. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> Just wait until I show you what I'm going to do with GPT-4. Let's actually, let's... Let's see something real quick in GPT-4, just since this is the right time to show it. So um, let's see, write a sentence about a beautiful, I spelled it wrong, audience. I'm not even going to correct the spelling at Tech Alley, where the first letter of each word is a letter of the alphabet in order. I could have even said uh, absidetic and it would have figured that out too. So let's see what we get. All right, so at Tech Alley, before captivating developers eagerly flocked, glorious humans inquisitively jousted, kindly listening, making notable observations, patiently questioning, respectful, uh, respectfully sharing thoughts, understanding, valuing wondrous X-rayed, Hmm. Youthful Jeff. There's not a whole lot of things for Z, but I mean, that's pretty impressive. Like, how long would it take somebody to do that on their own? And that's the kind of power that you can get from GPT-4, but you can't make GPT-3 do that, or uh, 3.5 do that right now. Okay, so language translation. All right, translate this, the, I'll say the previous poem. I'm not sure which one it's going to think I mean by that. Into, what's a cool language? Klingon. <laughs> I, I, I have never tried this. That just came off the top of my head. I don't know if it'll do it. Okay, so unfortunately, I'm not able to translate into Klingon. Okay, try translate into... Uh, who speaks French? Anyone here that can verify that this is correct? Uh, how about Spanish? Spanish? Okay. Uh, into Spanish. I should have tried Dothraki. All right, so it did actually know I meant the previous one before, so that's pretty cool, too. Does that seem like a pretty reasonable translation to anyone? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In Spanish? Yeah. All right. Oh. How do you spell rhyme? R-Y-H-M-E. Oh, is that right? No, there's a T. All right, what was that again? H-Y-M-E. It's one of those other words that's just always like, doesn't seem to come out right. Make it rhyme in Spanish. All right, somebody's going to have to verify this for me as well. Is that working? Or is that not even close? Yeah? Okay, cool, cool. All right, so um, let me start a new prompt here. Um, we can also use this as like an interactive teacher, and I use it quite often for this kind of stuff. So teach me how to juggle. I'm actually learning how to juggle again right now. I learned in college and then I kind of forgot, so I'm learning how to do it again. So start with one ball, add a second ball, practice the pattern. And this is exactly how I do it too. Keep practicing, I just juggle the two balls, and then try different objects once you're comfortable with juggling three balls. So, I mean, that's the steps. Yes? How much context can you give this, this web API? So it depends on the model. Uh, GPT 3.5, I believe, takes uh, 4,000 tokens. I think there's a version that'll take 8,000 tokens. And a token's roughly equivalent to a word. Not exactly. They use n grams. 10,000 tokens on Yeah, but I think on GPT 4, yeah, I, I'm not mistaken, it was limited to 4,000 when I first started using it this week. But I think they expanded it to, I want to say 32,000, but don't quote me on that. because. Yeah, I could, I could, I could feed in a dictionary of Klingon, and it would then produce it. Yeah, yeah. I didn't realize was already. Yeah, it just came out this week. Yep. Okay. So, um, what's something else somebody wants to learn how to do? Yep. Uh, yeah, because you're, um, you essentially are the product. Um, it's no, no secret that OpenAI is going to use this data in order to improve their models. Whether they're going to use it to market to you, probably not. OpenAI is a unique company in that it's a uh, cap limit or uh, cap profit. yeah, cap profit company. 
So they exist to create this research to get it out to the world, but they are not a for-profit company in the normal sense of it. They take investments from big companies you know, to, to essentially do what they're doing, but they're not out there to start marketing and stuff. If they got sold or something, which I don't know that they can under their charter, um, maybe, but right now they're using your data to refine their model to make it better. And it, it's, that's how they do this, essentially using, anytime I say, no, that's the wrong answer, or no, nah, not exactly what I'm looking for. That is data that's going in to train the next version of this model. And now that they've got, oh God, it's, it's the fastest growing web service in the history of the internet right now. They've got more people feeding data into this than we've ever had. So it's gonna get good real fast, yes. Do you know how ChatGPT affects SEO? Because I know if, like, you look, like, if you're like, oh, tell me about plumbers in my area, where is it pulling that information from? Is it from Google? Um, yeah, so this, the corpus of text that it uses is uh, Wikipedia, a whole bunch of reliable documents from like research articles and stuff like that. But then they've got the common crawl, which is essentially just uh, a filtered list of everything you can find on the internet just by searching for it. Um, but they filter it so that certain things are removed. And then they have kind of post filtering as well, well too, where they filter out certain harmful ideas and stuff. Is yes. there a way to get it to recommend your business to people? Um, well, you can use it to generate things that would help your SEO, but keep in mind that Google's already got, I believe they exist now, models that will detect text generated by this and will downscore you. And we don't know that it's not transparent yet, um, whether they're able to detect all kinds or whether the new models are improving faster than they can keep up. There's an arms race Perhaps going on right now. Compete against open AI, so they want to like Potentially. I mean, it's clear that um, OpenAI is more aligned with Microsoft than it is with Google, but Google has its own internal products that are doing the same thing that could actually be way better than anything we've seen so far because the Lambda E, our Palm E model, which is based on Lambda and in embodied context where it's actually a robot is using it, you can speak to the robot and it will understand what you're saying in natural language and it can execute tasks according to that. So do prompts using your voice instead of text? Yeah, yeah, and you could do that right now with a, a bit of a hack with, yeah, you could, it, it'd be pretty easy to do. Uh, simple API called a Microsoft custom voice model and then just feed it right in through the API. Yeah, you could build it in like that, yep. Yes? One, can you zoom in? Oh, zoom in to the text? Yeah. All right, I will try doing that here. Just do control plus. Control plus. Better? Okay, I was trying to do that earlier, One but more. nobody seemed to want. One more? Okay, I wish I could close this, but I, I don't think I can. Okay, question. In what is the max word length for a prompt? Yep. Um, uh, roughly 4,000 words right now. 4,000 words. Yep. I know that it can summarize a URL. So, um, yes and no. If it recognizes the URL as an article or something that it previously has in its model, sometimes it'll pick up on that and use it, but it cannot go out to the web to search. We'll talk about that later. In fact, maybe we should hold off on the questions until the end of the demo, because I think a lot of these questions will be answered in the caveats and the alternatives. Okay, uh, these questions real quick, and then we'll move on. Um, from earlier, you were saying that it pulls data, say, from Wikipedia or different type of resources. Yep. So say if I add a page, like right now, Wikipedia, how quick would it be for chat GPT? So once again, we'll, we'll talk about that in the caveats, but the data is capped at 2021 right now. However, an alternative, Bing chat can actually search the internet in real time. We'll talk about that later. Okay, so we'll keep moving on with the demo. Um, so interactive teachers, is there anything else anybody wanted to learn how to do here real quick? That sounds like it's a bit complicated. Yes. Did you ask it how to hide the sidebar? How to, <laughs> all right. How do I hide? I don't think you can. Well, you could technically hack it through Chrome developer tools. Sidebar on GPT-3, no, chat GPT, GPT. To hide the sidebar, you can simply click the hide sidebar button located at the... <laughs> Maybe it's hidden now that I'm zoomed in. No, I'm not seeing it. Maybe it got removed. Control H. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I could do it through the Google uh, developer tools or Chrome developer tools. I'm not going to worry about it, though. We're almost done with the demo for this part anyways. Okay. I think you could draw, drag it over. Try to drag it over. Yeah, I can probably make that work, too. Oh, look at that. Oh, that's interesting. So we'll just leave it like this. I'll, I'll expand it a little bit. Thanks. Oh, got to be careful. That's tricky. Okay, so uh, troubleshooting. So... Um, uh, what do I do if the red check 
engine light is whoops, is on in my Toyota Toyota Prius. I don't drive a Prius anymore, but I used to. Okay. Oh, that's weird. Now it's changed how the enter key works that I zoomed in. So in terms of like troubleshooting, you can ask some pretty specific questions. Like I mentioned before, I used it to figure out what was wrong with my washing machine. I'm like, hey, I've got an LG model, blah, blah, blah. Um, I'm getting this weird three letter code, which didn't seem to resonate to me. What does this mean? Oh, that means it's time to do a full clean cycle of the washing machine. I'm like, that's a thing you do? Like, like self-cleaning ovens, it's got a self-cleaning feature on it? So I did it and sure enough, the error warning went away. So like anytime I'm running into a problem like that, and not just for uh, you know, physical objects and technical things, I use this for code. I will paste in a line of code, I'm getting this error message, why? And like some of these errors it's pointed out would have taken me literally three hours to figure out on my own because I've been stuck in really bad bugs before. And it'll be, oh, well, you know, maybe you should try this. No, that's not right. It, it, it's more, it's something with this, I think. Oh, well, in that case, you probably have blank spaces at the end of your, you know, regex expression that shouldn't be there. Oh, yeah, that's it. And all of a sudden, I fixed it. And it took me 15 minutes rather than three hours or even less than that. Yeah. What do you think we'll be doing with this in two or three years? Let's talk about that later, too, because that's, that's a, a good segue into the... When you, put, when you put that code in, it's not yours anymore. Um, okay. So we can talk about that, too, because the, the uh, copyright laws right now are very gray, but some things have already come out that tell us what we can and can't do. And, and it's evolving right now, but let's, let's save that one for later as well. All right, and last, code generation. I'm just gonna do a quick demo of this because this is what I'm gonna be talking about in my uh, presentation next month. So write me a quick script in Python that loads data into a, from a CSV file into a pandas data frame and then uh, creates a bar chart of sales over time. Whoops, it changes how that works, that's weird. Sure, here's a quick script. Anyone that knows Python like me can tell pretty quick that this is, this is good code. And I can also say, um, create the data visualization using Seaborn instead of MATLAB. Oops, and that's not a question mark. As soon as, soon as I zoom in, it changes the way the enter key works, and that's really frustrating because I'm so used to doing it the other way. All right, so now it's using Seaborn. You can see it imported the Seaborn library up here and it's using the Seaborn syntax instead of matplotlib. So you can interactively code with this thing and it can do some pretty, pretty impressive stuff. But that's just a teaser for next month. All right, so you're gonna show a couple very specific use yeah. cases, business cases with it. Yeah, oh, let me, quick. Let me get, get it back to how it was. Okay, yeah. so how many people have thought about opening up a business or any hands, business ideas? Um, how many entrepreneurs or small business owners are actually here today? Awesome. Okay, wow. So probably like half the room. Okay, well, I want to talk about it on a, like a business development part tool as well to be able to create a business plan. So let's take a look to see. Oh, provide me a list of 10 top business ideas in the U.S. Yeah, you have to hit the, the icon now. So here are 10 top businesses that you could that you could open up today that is relevant to markets. So if you were just contemplating a business idea, you could use ChatGPT to be able to find out is this viable and whatnot and what businesses are currently being successful. Uh, let's see, so let's see what it actually provided. So, okay, top 10 list of business ideas, an e-commerce business, that's really huge right now, especially after COVID happening. Uh, there's a lot of conversion into e-commerce, food trucks, 
online learning platforms. That's a really big one, and that's something that you can actually utilize ChatGPT for. Health and wellness, I think I kind of gave that scenario about how do I build a customizable plan using a paleo or keto-based diet for five days, three meals a day, and that's something that you could plug in and create a meal plan for yourself. Um, social media management, people, uh, influencers are using this every day to create content for themselves. Eco-friendly products, mobile apps, or virtual events, pet care services, cleaning services. So you could see, like, if you're trying to generate an idea, you could utilize this to implement on your business plan. So now I'm going to take one of these. Let's say, let's take clean cleaning services. Uh, create. Oops. If you want, I can do the typing for you. I mean, it might be easier. It's my keyboard, okay, and you're not used yeah. to it. Okay. So let's create a business plan. Create a business plan, a four-page business plan okay. for cleaning services. Company? Company. <sighs> so as you can see, it's created an executive summary, a company overview, a market analysis, a marketing strategy behind this, operations plan, financial plan, and a conclusion. And let's pro let's provide resources, provide resources to create this business plan. So these are, because I work with a lot of entrepreneurs, and I'm looking at this right now, and SBA, SCORE, the, last, the local chambers of commerce, these are all organizations that you could utilize to help you build your business plan, and a lot of these services are for free, and a lot of people are not aware that the SBA, their services, the Small Business Development Center, they, you could actually have an advisor advise you and guide you um, in this business process, if you're building out a plan, if you need a marketing plan, if you need analysis reports. So this is the capabilities that this chat, this ChatGPT could actually utilize today. And then one of the things that, one of the prompts that also Matthew went over today is now how do I translate this in Spanish or a different language? Or translate this into Spanish. And it will go ahead and, Oops, have you I seen earlier, translate it, but. as you've seen earlier, it will provide it to you in a different language. And then you could ask it, ask it to um, teach it to me like a fifth grader. Yeah, so, I should have added that. So for people that, you know, if you wanted to make sense in a, in a simple language, everyday language that we could, some, sometimes not a little over our heads, um, you, could ask, you could ask it to explain it to you like a fifth grader. So I'm typing, explain quantum physics to me like I'm a five-year-old. <laughs> we'll see. Quantum physics is a type of science that helps us to understand the really small things in the world around us, like atoms and particles that are too tiny for us to see. These small things don't always act the way we expect them to. Sometimes they act like waves. Sometimes they act like little balls. Scientists are trying to figure out why they do this, exclamation mark. It's a bit like a game of hide and seek. <laughs> 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 are really good at hiding. That's actually pretty good. But science is keeping trying to find them the more they look. I mean, that, that yeah. resonates with me as much as I know about quantum physics. Yeah, so these are the capabilities that you could use this on not only on a personal level, but if you're, if you're thinking or flirting with a business idea. So I just wanted to give that case scenario because I encounter this in my daily, in my daily routine of life and working for economic development and being able to provide resources for people that are out there that are not aware that these resources are out there. Most of them, again, are for free. How do I talk to my child about starting a cleaning business? Mm -hmm. This Perfect. seems like good advice. Involve your child in the planning process. Teach responsibility, encourage creativity, empathize, emphasize the money value. Yeah, make it fun. Start cool. by cleaning your room. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's try that. How do I get my kid to clean his room? There, I'll say their room. Question mark. Enter button. Can be a challenge, yeah, but a few strategies. Set clear expectations, make a routine, break it down into small tasks, make it fun, provide incentives, lead by example. 
There you go, yeah. Bribery. Yeah. So these Bribery. are just different case scenarios, and I know you have a presentation to give to us. So I just want to run those ideas by you because I know a lot of, half of you in the room look like you're either small business owners and entrepreneurs or have an idea that you want to part with. So this is a great tool to utilize for that. All right. So uh, to wrap things, well, not wrap things up, to continue here, I just want to talk about, like, this was the awesome stuff that we saw, but it's not just all sunshine and rainbows here. There, there are some definite things you need to consider. Uh, Oh, yep, one second. I have to start the presentation back up. Uh, there are definitely some things you have to consider um, when using this. So a few caveats or little disclaimers. Um, it does roughly B plus work. I mean, it's not going to write like a super awesome essay the first time. But if you get B plus work out of it, a couple iterations, you can make it A plus work pretty quick. Don't ever just, oh, hey, write this marketing summary and then send it to your boss. Go through, check it, make sure it's what you want to say. Because... It likes to hallucinate information. It's getting better at this. But for example, I asked it, hey, give me the top five papers on, uh, I think it was uh, large language models or something like that back in the day. And uh, it gave me five articles, all look completely legit. Three of them were real. I went to the source and I verified it. Two of them completely made up. I went to the journal. The author wasn't there that month. It wasn't on the page that it said it was on. I searched the internet. I could not find this journal. It, those two articles do not exist. So, and you have to double check its work. Uh, it only has data up to 2021, so you can't ask it new questions, but we'll talk about an alternative to that. And it has no real-time web search. It was trained on a corpus of data from 2021. It knows nothing about the world since then. Even if you tell it, hey, do you know that GPT-4 exists? Nope, I don't know that. Well, I just told you. Cool. <laughs> so uh, it also has a character limit. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, 4,000 tokens. I believe there's models that can take 8,000. I think GPT-4, I think it was 32,000, but I can't remember for sure. Um, for like 30 days too, right? The, the, the what? Uh, so if you, if you have the API and you're paying for it, um, you can create custom models and stuff and, and keep that around. Yeah. Yeah, it's like 30 days. Okay, I was thinking yep. four was Oh, yeah, they added something to have it delete stuff after a certain time period by default. I think you can turn that off, though, but I'm not positive. I haven't tried it yet. Uh, so there are some limitations as well, especially when it gets busy. Because, like, if a new article comes out, they hammer the website and you can't use it. It's like, oh, we're too busy. Here's a nice poem in haiku um, just about why chat GPT is down right now. So you can pay 20 bucks a month and get the pro version. It's got faster responses. Um, it gives you higher availability, so less downtime. Uh, you get early features, which that's why you know, I get GPT-4 right away as soon as it was released, because you get all the early features as they come out, roughly 20 bucks a month. So now GPT-4 is much smarter than GPT-3. Uh, you guys can't see this. These are all of the exams. In blue is what GPT-3.5 could do, or GPT, yeah, 3.5. In green is what GPT-4 can do. Some of these, it's passing the bar exam, AP mathematics, it's passing, you name it. Uh, it knows science, it knows chemistry, it knows math, it knows, well, it doesn't do as well on some of the English exams, which seems really strange because it's a large language model, and it can pass a lot of programming tests too, like college-level programming exams. They added math. Oh, so what? They added math. Yes, it wasn't great with the first version of ChatGPT, but then they made an update in, I think, January that added a bunch more mathematical capabilities. Oh, I didn't mention this, but we're discovering some pretty interesting stuff. As we scale these models up, it'll be terrible, 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 terrible at doing this, all of a sudden really good. And it's just like, well, we tried, you know, we had tried a million you know, units of text or a million parameters, and it couldn't do it. And then we got to a million and one, and all of a sudden it's, it's an expert at it. I heard that. We refer to this as emergent, yeah. yeah, emergent features or emergent behaviors. And we're seeing a lot of this coming out in ways that we're not able to easily predict. Yeah, GPT-4 also has vision capabilities. So you can essentially show it a picture and it will you know, uh, tell you what's in it. But it's slower than GPT-3.5 Turbo. So I typically use GPT-3.5 Turbo first. And if I can't get what I need, I switch over to a GPT-4. And I've also learned where it's good at different things. So I know when to do it in GPT-4 now and when to do it in GPT-3.5. Um, we already showed you just a little bit of GPT-4, but I can show more if you guys want to hang out afterwards. Um, and we can go in the hallway or somewhere else. And then in terms of alternatives, um, so OpenAI, uh, we've got GPT-3.5. But we've also got Microsoft uh, Bing Chat, which I can show you a demo of two if you're interested. Uh, Google has their Lambda, BARD, and most recently they announced Palm E, which isn't available to the public, but they just announced that they integrated Lambda, I think Lambda and BARD, into all of their uh, uh, productivity tools. And Microsoft just announced that 
Uh, their version of GPT is in all of Microsoft Office, and it does some pretty amazing stuff. Uh, and then there's also open source versions like BERT. You can download from huggingface.com and use it on your computer if you want. You can custom train it and everything. So some of the Bing chat features, it's up to date. So everything is uh, new. It can search the web for information. It can also read PDFs that you give it and pull the text right out of it. Um, it can also provide you with sources of where it got its information, which I can't wait until they add that to GPT because it can't hallucinate. If you've got a source, you can just click on and pull up that information. And it's also better at some tasks. However, it's really moody. Like it refuses, just flat out refuses to answer questions for you. I don't know why. It's like, this is a completely legitimate question. Nope, I'm not doing it. And it's like, okay. Um, it'll refuse to perform certain tasks. It'll say, ah, oh, this is pretty complicated. I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> I think it's a money thing. Like it just takes too many com computational cycles to do it. And um, they may have removed this uh, like this week, but we, last time I tried it, you could only do five prompts and responses and then it cuts it off because people were tricking it out of its normal behavioral mode and getting it to do some really weird stuff. And um, it's also limited to early access. So I've got access to it because I'm a Microsoft MVP, but um, not everybody gets access to it. Okay, so we've got a little bit of time. This ends at 2.30, right? Yeah. Okay, a little bit of time for questions and group discussion. And then we've just got a couple slides right at the yeah. end. Okay, so questions, yes? Uh, so I've noticed getting ChatGPT to work for domain specific things can be difficult. Like you said, you find a book. Yep. You can only feed it so many characters. How would you actually get it to work on something that's domain specific? So, great question as well. Um, I mentioned that you have, if you have access to the API, which you can get if you have a developer's license for it, you can train custom models where you can feed it way more than the limited number of characters as part of a, a prompt response set of pairs. So say for example, you're trying to, uh, what's a good example? Um, we'll just, I'm not recommending anybody do this, but say you're trying to use it for medical diagnostics. You could essentially give it a list of all of the, you know, the, the data for the patient and say, here's what the diagnosis was. Here's another example, here's what the diagnosis was. Give it hundreds, if not thousands of samples, though oftentimes three samples is enough to, for it to do some pretty impressive stuff. Um, it will essentially learn what the inputs are, what the outputs are, and learn how to speak in the language of the doctor's diagnostic criteria. And like I said, don't do it for this, but in the future, this is probably what it's gonna look like. You'll have a doctor assessing a patient with the same data that a, an AI is using. They will both come up with their diagno diagnosis and their recommended treatment protocol. And then if they agree, they'll most likely move forward with the treatment protocol. If they disagree, another do human doctor will be brought in not knowing who made which decision to assess it and then act as a tiebreaker. Mm -hmm. Yes? Any guidance no, on how to ask open-ended questions versus kind of biased or you know, kind of leading the witness? Uh, so yeah, it, it is, it is definitely left leaning in terms of its, uh, programming. There's a lot of people that have tried exploring, like what are its biases and it definitely like in terms of politics, it leans a bit left, but it's not really out there anywhere that I've seen so far in terms of like radical kind of ideologies and stuff like that, but it definitely does have biases and it will, um, it's gender biases are built into it. Um, it's got a bit of, uh, like racial biases as well too. They've done their best to eliminate this using something called reinforcement learning, where they had a human, uh, humans look at every, you know, ask, uh, a question that was asked and the response that came out. And the human then essentially tries nudging it in the right direction in order to eliminate these biases. But once again, as humans, we all have biases too. So through a process of having multiple people do this, you hope the idea is to kind of have the aggregate answer, the wisdom of the crowds be to not be racist or, you know, gender. So, yeah. so good point, but I, I was asking from the oh. point of that people sometimes ask questions from their bias and they don't get an open answer because... They don't get the answer they want, you mean, or...? Well, they don't ask it. They don't ask open questions. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they might say, I don't know, Oh, gotcha. Leading the witness. Okay. I understand now. Yeah. You can, you can definitely fall into your own echo chamber with it. And especially, and this is why I think Microsoft limited it to five interactions. Cause if you started talking in extremely like fascist language or something like that over enough conversation with this thing, it'd start speaking like that too, because that's all of the prompts it's seen in its last 4,000 know, characters. It has stuff to correct for that. But like I said, if you talk to it long enough, it'll start picking up on what you're thinking or whatever. And that's why I think there was a guy who had a conversation with it where it eventually told him, you don't love your wife, you should leave her for me. <laughs> yeah, it, this really happened. I, I think it, it was it was largely because it was picking up on things he was saying that may have been an indication. 
I don't know. I'm speculating there. Okay, so um, no, we'll have to hold off questions, but I will be outside so you can ask me anything you want. I'll stick around for a while, but we just have to talk about a few final things. Oops, I'm going the wrong way with this. Um, so first, I'm going to be uh, going forward. I'm hosting a new uh, meetup called the Las Vegas AI Meetup. It's going to be once a month. It's going to be to talk about topics like artificial intelligence, machine learning, data science, these kind of topics. Uh, they'll, they'll start with a short demo, kind of like we did today, but typically a bit shorter, and then open for discussion. I want to spend as much time discussing these things in a group as I do essentially telling you about them or teaching you about them. And we'll be discussing new topics each month. It's going to be part of Tech Alley, so it'll be here every uh, Saturday going forward. Next month, we're going to be talking about AI for code. I'll show a demo of GitHub Copilot and uh, using ChatGPT for code generation specific tasks. And then we'll have a group discussion to talk about, well, how is this going to impact software developers and IT professionals? And then going forward, we'll do AI for images and like AI for creative things involving DALI, uh, Stable Diffusion, and Midjourney. AI ethics in June. Uh, probably privacy and AI. I think I'm going to do bias in AI, though. I think that's a, a more uh, timely topic. And then explainable AI and some of the research that I'm doing on explainable AI. Um, I'm not sure if it is, but can we update the Meetup or any different platform that we have in the groups in? Because for me, I'd rather do a little research so that I can ask more in-depth questions. And bring up the topics are and laying up us to uh, get more of an in-depth question and answer. Yeah, and I should probably clarify. So um, she has her own meetup. I have my own oh, meetup. Yeah, we, we joined together for this one because it felt like the right thing to do. Yeah. Uh, but we'll be kind of diverging in terms of the topics that we're covering. Uh, yours is more focused on business and GPT to help businesses. Correct. Mine's more focused on kind of general AI uh, and discussions about AI and mm -hmm. new topics. Um, but yeah, I've got three months worth of the topics on my website. And I'll probably move it up to six months out going forward. Um, and if you want to learn anything more about what I'm doing, uh, this will take you right to my website. I'll leave it up for a few seconds, and you've got a final slide to wrap things up. Yes. So oh. I'll just let you give you a few minutes to. Otherwise, it's just MatthewRenzi.com. Download that. For sure, the spelling, because you didn't know how to spell really. <laughs> <laughs> you know, ah, spelling. It's weird. As I get older, I find that my uh, my error rate is going up. I have a tendency to uh, talk too fast with one hand or type too fast with the other, and so my letters are getting crossed over. And I don't I don't know why or if this is going to keep going. So, okay. Let's give Matthew Renzi a round of applause. He's brilliant. So I'm very grateful to have him as my guest speaker today. Um, I just want to talk a little bit more about the ChatGPT Mastermind and for future events. This is going to be a continuous meetup as well, talking about personal and business aspects of life as well, and being able to help businesses and entrepreneurs that are trying to utilize, trying to utilize this tool as well. Um, so there's going to be networking and social events. There's going to be workshops that are going to be held in the future, guest speakers that are going to come to the Mastermind as well talking about different subject matters. Uh, we'll have panel discussions, and hopefully one day we'll hold an AI summit for two days in Las Vegas. So I would love to make that happen and be able to create that momentum here for Las Vegas and our community as a whole, um, not from a career perspective, but a personal perspective, because this is going to revolutionize, again, how we do business, how we interact with each other, how we're able to create efficiencies and be able to use this tool today and be able to be prepared for use, utilizing this tool today because it's only gonna it's only gonna spring forward here. And so um, thank you all for coming out today. I wanna thank Tech Alley. If you guys have not, if you have not been part of Tech Alley, it's a monthly business meetup. There's about 15 different other business meetups held here in our district in downtown. So please make sure to go to techalley.org to see what other meetups are out there as well.